<clears throat> Just gonna give it one more minute before we get started. we can get started. Welcome everyone to tonight's event. My name is Dr. Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Direct Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. We are delighted to launch Dr. Umid Kurt's new book, The Armenians of Ein Tab, The Eco Economics of Genocide in an Ottoman Province to mark Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. Dr. Kurt, born and raised in Gazi Ein Tab, Turkey, was astonished to learn that his hometown once had a large and active Armenian community. The Armenian presence in Ein Tab, the city's name during the Ottoman period, had not only been destroyed, it had been replaced. In his book, Dr. Kurt digs into the details of the Armenian dispossession that produced the homogeneously Turkish city in which he grew up. Kurt shows that the prospect of material gain was a key motivator of support for the Armenian genocide among the local Muslim gentry and the Turkish public. Those who benefited most, provincial elites, wealthy landowners, state officials, and merchants who accumulated Armenian capital in turn financed the nationalist movement that brought the modern Turkish Republic into being. The economic elite of Eintab was thus reconstituted along both ethnic and political lines. Tonight, we are very pleased that Dr. Kurt will be led in conversation about his book, which provides a history of genocide at the local level by Professor Stefan Erig. But before I introduce our speakers, just a few notes of housekeeping. You'll be kept on mute during the entire program uh, but if you do have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat at any time. Um, you can send the chat, uh, the question or comment directly to me or to Professor Erig. Um, and after the formal conversation, we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. The event is also being recorded, but your camera will not appear on the screen. Um, we've also enabled auto captioning for those who wish to use it. And I'll also put this in the chat. You can find this at the bottom of your screen. But please note that it is an automated closed captioning and therefore sometimes the words on the screen do not accurately reflect the words of the speaker. So if you have any technical difficulty, please send a note uh, either to me or my colleague Sonia and we will try our best to help you. And now to our speakers. Dr. Umid Kurt is Polanski Fellow at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. Apologies, my screen just did something strange. Uh, the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute and an Australian Research Council Fellow. He is the author of several books in Turkish and English, including The Spirit of the Laws, The Plunder of Wealth in the Armenian Genocide. He's a fellow graduate of Clark University, where he earned his PhD in 2016, and also a former Erie fellow at the Wiener Holocaust Library. So it is with great personal pleasure that I host tonight's event in support of his book and his important research. Stefan Erig is a professor of history at the University of Haifa and director of the Haifa Center of German and European Studies. He works on various aspects of European and Middle Eastern history with an interest in the media as well as political and social discourses. He is co-editor of the Journal of Holocaust Research. And now I hand the virtual floor over to Professor Erik. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody. It's really a great pleasure to be part of this event today. Not only because it's always fun to talk with Umit, who is a great um, gentleman, scholar and a friend, and it's always exciting and it's inspiring, but also because I really like the topics um, Umit is working on. So as um, Christine already introduced uh, him, he's the author of quite a number of books and articles in Turkish and English. Um, and one of his aspects there is the aspect of plunder of wealth, property, property redistribution in times of genocide. And for me, this is very interesting. Uh, we often, and myself included, focus on meta discourses when it comes to genocide and motivations. But, you know, it's often really about material gain as well. 
Um, and to look at the factor of material gain makes, of course, more sense if you look at it very closely on a local level. And this is exactly what UMIT is doing. Um, and this book now, especially very interesting, as also Christine already introduced, it's not something that's very distant from our author with whom we're talking today. That's actually the town he is from. And I will also have a question regarding all of this. So <clears throat> me and Umit, we talk sometimes. Um, we also already discussed a little bit, you know, what is so interesting about his book right here. So I'm going to uh, kick off. I'm not going to talk much myself, I hope. Um, this is always a danger. I want to have Umit talk. We have the author here with us and then also to let you um, have questions and discussions with him. Um, so the first thing, Umit, is this a typical genocide book? Thank you so much, dear Stefan. It's 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 great to be with you here, um, and 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 thank you. So I I'm also grateful for the invaluable support of the Weiner Library, um, Holocaust Library in London. Um, is this a typical genocide book? Uh, no, it it is not a typical genocide book. Actually, um, honestly, I wouldn't want my uh, book or the story of the book, The Crux of the Matter, uh, considered from the point of view of genocide studies or genocide field or genocide uh, scholars. It's a book uh, about actually the history of a city which was a late Ottoman city and, and also a city evolved into, uh, you know, Gaziant from Aintab to Gaziantep during the Republican uh, era uh, too. Uh, the book talks about uh, a, 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 a story of a traumatic society, the Armenians of Aintab, which constitute the main actors of the city uh, whose, uh, public, whose uh, demography or population number like around 40,000 out of 80,000. Um, so this story, the confiscation, liquidation, and the plunder of the mobile and immobile properties of this city and the Armenians actually, Arme Armenians of the city, was, was also the story of other provinces, districts um, in Asia Minor in Anatolia too. Um, that's why the book investigates uh, local and regional dynamics with a particular emphasis on the dis disintegration of social relations and the breakdown of social fabric in the city of Aintab uh, to contextualize developments that led to persecution, forced deportation, and mass murder of Armenians and the dispossession of their property. Uh, doing so enables me to demonstrate the complex picture of uh, not only relations between central and local actors, but also each group's internal relations, let's say. So thus uh, the book brings together analysis at the micro level. Uh, what I mean by micro level is to contextualize the genocide in global and national contexts, and the meso level, revealing and discussing the activities of various middlemen of violence, let's say notables, mid-ranking officers, tribal leaders and so forth. And finally, the micro, the micro level. So dissecting how the process unfolded in uh, the various regional microcode, uh, an approach actually that has been missing in the literature, I would say. It also provides new insights on the causes and origins of genocidal policies and their impact in making and remaking of provincial elites and by extension, uh, provincial elites of the modern Turkish Republic uh, as well, I would say. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, what is clear already from your answer and, um, it, you know, also perhaps to, uh, um, I don't know, uh, rephrase this again for the people who haven't had the chance to read your book yet. Um, there is the Armenian genocide, the redistribution of properties, but your book is a long story. You started before the events and you continue afterwards. 
um, how does this kind of look at the long duration of things, you know, with this uh, big context you're making, uh, you're opening up there, how does it compare to other studies in the field who are also looking sometimes at this longer uh, context, I'm thinking about our colleague um, Ur Umut Unger, for example, but also others. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the book covers actually the time period uh, from the mid 19th century to all the way leading up to 1940s with a particular focus on uh, the property confiscation, liquidation and plunder. Uh, these are all economics aspects of the political and collective violence which were, which were inflicted upon the Armenians of the city. Done. And also uh, formation of the classes the provincial elites, Mütegallibe or Ayan in Turkish, these classes, you know, they consolidated their uh, status, class status, and then in 30s and 40s, these provincial elites or notables or landowners become the uh, bourgeois, Turkish Muslim bourgeois of the, of the, of the, of the uh, modern Turkey as well. Um, as Hilmar Kaiser, and Ur Unger also successfully did in the case of the Arabic here. Uh, I pay particular attention to local dynamics uh, of genocide, its political, social, uh, economic legacies, and the role of local actors as they have also done, civilian and military authorities. But the book distinguished itself from uh, those scholars work by combining Armenian and Turkish documentation. So as well as um, uh, employing unmined, untapped Armenian and Turkish sources as well as other archival materials. So it it does not the story does not start with the 1915. You know the, the this this particular moment which the violence erupted and which was known or amount to genocide as we know today. But before getting into this this moment, uh, I try to explain how. Uh, Harmon uh, relatively speaking for sure, harmonious relationships between two uh, different ethno national uh, ethno national ethno religious communities, how this relationship got strained and how this relationship uh, which were harmonious relatively speaking turned into you know resentment turned into expressing itself through resentment, fear and culminated in this this, this uh, massive amount of violence alongside plunder and also property uh, confiscation as well. For the first time in this book, I am uh, using a document uh, of the, the, the transaction reports of the liquidation commission, Eintop liquidation commission. Liquidation commissions were established by the Union and Progress Party, Ottoman ruling government back then in September, 1915. These commissions, uh, the main objective or the duty of these commissions was to was to liquidate, move especially movable properties of Armenians. So um, these abundant property liquidation commissions were established uh, and formed in almost 34, 35 provinces and districts of Ottoman Empire in Asia Minor, and and these uh, commissions had records, and those records were kept by the president of these each and every uh, liquidation commission and one copy of these transaction reports was supposed to be sent to the minister of interior and the finance minister and one copy of the same transaction reports was supposed to be handed over to um, CUP's general secretary of each and every, every province, uh, responsible secretary. And over the course of one, my one and a half year research in Ottoman prime ministry archives, each and every time I asked for the presence of these documents and my requests were always declined. And I was, uh, the response was always the following. Uh, we haven't classified those documents yet, which means these documents do exist, but inaccessible to researchers. But out of a sheer coincidence, I happened to acquire, uh, obtain only transaction reports of an only one Armenian deportee from my hometown, Aintab, Sarkis Yakupyan. And I, I published this document. Uh, and this, this document shows us how liquidation and the confiscation as an economic and political activity of a ruling government on the ground level 
was executed, was carried out. For the first time, uh, we can see uh, substantially how this property liquidation was carried out by the state officers, uh, I would say. So look, you basically preempted already one of my next questions about um, sources. Um, mm -hmm. um, Umid, uh, if you don't know it, is um, one of these very uh, inspired historians who can go to all different kinds of sources, national and local, and in many different languages. So it's quite amazing what you normally do. I don't know if you want to round something up, but let me um, <clears throat> let me uh, contextualize it even further. I'm very excited about your book uh, and also about others coming out in these years, because I feel that in the whole field, you know, there is an amazing, what do you say, development happening over the last 10, 15 years. You know, you have this um, strong push for consolidation. You have uh, these big momentous studies like Raymond Kevorkian's. And then you have all these different new kind of scholars who are going into the long durée or in the local who are combining different aspects. There is really there are amazing things happening in the field. <clears throat> so how do you relate yourself to this evolving and developing field? Um, mm -hmm. Actually, my uh, my sole concern uh, when I was really really focusing and concentrating on a, 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 uh, an, uh, a small I mean not small city a city you know as a microcosm actually in order to find. Uh, possible potential answers of larger questions about the, about the empire about the reason why the empire was collapsed what happened to you know uh, citizens and subjects of this uh, this empire how this uh, you know uh, to a certain extent civic ottoman civic uh, citizenship failed in 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 this whole process and how this calamity was carried out you know uh, at the end of the day uh, you are applying genocidal policies to, you know, uh, your citizens, and also as a political party, you cooperate with them uh, by uh, since 1908 Young Turk Revolution. So, micro is history is uh, supposed to be related to either symbolic or actual dimension of the topic or or the or, or, of the, of or, or the object. So, for instance. Micro historians, particularly, are interested in uh, marginal people. So, but it's not the case here. So, in fact, uh, the prefix micro is related to its, its microscope. So, this is what uh, I am exactly doing in terms of elucidating and unfolding the set of events in Aintab from Hamidian per period to all the way leading up to the early Republican period, 40 years. So, in order to uh, create an analytical approach, bring, uh, come up with an analytical approach and analyzing all these small, tiny incidents at, in the provincial level, local level, in order to bring up a potential overarching, uh, overriding uh, expl explanation or explanatory tools for further questions, for larger questions about the empire. This book uh, does not solely concern destruction of, of, of a certain society. It is also about construction of another society on the basis of absence of this group of people. So uh, what I'm talking about is quite fun, foundational for, uh, for uh, modern Turkish state as well. And also what we are talking about is uh, a, a total uh, transformation of a city it's economic transformation, political transformation, cultural transformation, and transformation of space itself as well. Because Armenians of Aintab were not only stripped of their uh, economic wealth, their space, the space where they articulate their identity, their life practices each and every day, produce and reproduce. This space where they do, ex they used to exist also first destroyed and then constructed and transformed into a new space for new groups of people. Thank you. Um, so the next question is also perhaps something that uh, can connect your work to other people's work on genocide more in general and also where perhaps, you know, uh, it can shift a little bit perspectives uh, and it actually even connects to the first question I got from our group here, from our audience. 
So, you know, you've been working now on property redistribution uh, for quite a while uh, in the context of genocide. <clears throat> we call it plunder, but when you read your uh, work, for example, plunder has this, um, I don't know, this uh, kind of uh, feeling that it's disorganized. You show how organized it actually is. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, from your work, and also looking from Eintab now onto the larger um, picture of the Ottoman Empire at this time, how do you weigh, you know, ideology, geopolitical um, uh, motivations versus property, or is there a versus, or is it all part of one? Big... Wonder, wonderful question. Um, as first of all, uh, I must underline the fact that uh, the what makes Aintab distinguishing from other provinces. Uh, within the framework of all this destruction uh, process and so forth, uh, in terms of uh, motivations that uh, economic aspects, economic motivations were quite substantial in this city. You can measure the validity or reliability of this argu argumentation by looking at the motivations of uh, local actors provincial elite, big wigs, landowners, civil and military authorities, district governor of the city at the time, and so on and so forth. But that does not necessarily negate the importance of political and ideological motivations as well. They were, they were on the ground too, but economic, economic motivations, when you look at the extent of plunder, when you look at the transaction of Eintop liquidation commissions and post-genocide career of these perpetrators, you, you would see the main rallying uh, support and point, their focal point was to acquire these properties. But as for uh, motivations, again, there were, uh, they were both economic and social. On the economic side, uh, as I have underlined, the prospect of loot, for example, incentivized, encouraged local collaborators to support massacres, deportations, and realizing this potential the Union and Progress Party, the Ottoman ruling government at the time, its leadership deliberate, deliberately instrumentalized the promise of spoil and plunder to cudgel public participation. And the central government was well aware of the fact that provincial notables, land, uh, local landowners and the big big officials, rain, a range of other people with vested interests, they tried to take possession of Armenian wealth. And these actors found themselves in a a uh, uh, forti fortuitous position. Not only did their action fulfill uh, ideological requirements of the regime, but these actions also brought material gain uh, in the form of expropriated and pillaged uh, Armenian properties. So these factors in combination serve the catalyze further the persecution of Armenians. Therefore, uh, to, to me, a reward mechanism was created by the ruling government, which the CUP could draw political and social support for decisions to deport and massacre Armenians. And the profiters justify their confiscation and seizure of Armenian wealth, not as a robbery or plunder, but as fair reward for their active participation in the elimination of, in their eyes, harmful and tre uh, treacherous elements. So, that's why uh, beyond base greed, uh, the fervor uh, with which they executed the genocide on the local level, I think must be understood in part as a result of the rationalization that they were also acting in the service of the Ottoman state. On the social side, it's important to consider uh, the role of stolen and confiscated Armenian, uh, confiscated Armenian assets in the integration and consolidation of the process of Turkification or a Muslim controlled national economy, Milli Iktisat. Uh, the main purpose of Turkification was the dispossession of countless thousands of Armenians and their systematic removal from uh, virtually every sector of the economy by transferring Armenian mobile and immobile properties and businesses to Turkish hands. What I mean by Turkish here, Turkish hands essentially Muslim groups. So the slaughter and plunder uh, follow deliberated 
and declared intent on the part of the local perpetrators who were assisted in the deadly campaign by the Ottoman central authorities. Uh, of course, while the pattern of destruction remained locally determined, um, the central government provided the overall context that allowed for sustained human rights abuses and the crime against humanity and so on and so forth. What makes the local elites, the role of local elites, uh, again, distinguish and peculiar vis-a-vis -vis other cases in Aintab was that these local actors, they were the ones who persuaded central government, central government politicians to deport Armenians. They were more enthusiastic, more willing, more fervent and more zealous than the central actors, actually. Well, in the next question, I'm going to come, after the next question, I'm going to come back to Gazi Antep. Now I want to again take you to a much more broader kind of perspective. <clears throat> so, you know, um, with your years now on working on these topics, property redistribution, um, when you look at other genocides in history, and I know how difficult comparative history in these cases especially is, but when you, with your background, your experience, you know, re your reading of the sources and such, when you look at other genocides in history, do you think we as historians are doing a good enough job to take into account property redistribution and plunder? Mm -hmm. or, or, or do you think there is more to be done there? It's more important than we... Exactly, know. yeah. It's very important question. Thank you for uh, posing this question, Stefan. I think in, uh, I can only speak for the, the field of Armenian, uh, Armenian studies in general and Armenian genocide in particular. I think we lay way, way behind what, what has been happening in the literature of Holocaust, uh, you know, and, and, and what has been done regarding Cambodia, what has been done regarding Bangladesh, what has been done regarding, uh, you know, Rwanda and, 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 and so forth. So um, we need uh, more and more regional uh, studies, which uh, indicates regional variation, because uh, we are talking about a mass violence collective, collective violent event, collective violent event, and these kind, these set of events cannot be uh, ruled or cannot be executed from the uh, from the central government by like a remote control. You need social support, you need social underpinnings, you need political and support from the different sections of society. So you need to also convince and persuade, you know, your grassroots uh, in order to rely their support for, for, for this end. Uh, therefore, uh, how can we measure this aspect? We should go into the field. We should, because, uh, for instance, why why did Antep, why did the, why did the deportation decision for Aintap Armenians uh, 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 take uh, uh, why was it taken so late? You know, the first deporti deportation groups from Aintap uh, was set on on the road by August first, nineteen fifteen, vis-a-vis what already happened to Armenians in eastern provinces in western Armenia or in the eastern Anatolia. So. In order to answer the find possible answer to these questions, we need to do more micro level studies. We really, really uh, consider and, uh, and also as, uh, create an approach which requires taking into consideration regional variation because this Armenian genocide or the destruction of Armenians, destruction of the social fabrics of Armenians did not happen uh, similarly in each and every city or province of the Ottoman Empire. It varied from region to region. It varied from the, the, the profile of perpetrators to that of other perpetrators. It changed from moment to moment. And in, in certain moments, perpetrators uh, actually turn, uh, may have, uh, could have turned into uh, saviors, rescuers, and the other way around. We should take into consideration all these intricacies um, uh, of of this 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 uh, this process, uh, because genocide itself is a is a is a process, as Rafael Lemkin coined from the very beginning. Uh, therefore, uh, actually, that also take us uh, that also takes the uh, us uh, take the uh, burden of uh, proving the genocide from our shoulders. We should go beyond this, you know, 
uh, just proving, demonstrating that, okay, I found the document which indicated, you know, the killings of Armenians, proving that Armenians were really ki that they killed, uh, the conversion really took place. I think we are done with that kind of conventional argument. Argument. We need to go beyond this and, and to explain how this social, economic, political destruction process was uh, came into existence in different provinces, in, in different places in, in Anatolia. When, when I talk about this, uh, as you just mentioned, the struggle to constantly prove the existence of genocide in this case, um, for me, it's always also the same kind of point, you know, it's a process, you know, it's something genocide is uh, um, something that people have to do day after day after day, they have to go to bed and have to get up in the morning and continue with their bloody work. And as you and I and others know, you know, the provinces are connected to the center, the center is aware of what's going on. And then work such as yours become more important to understand this ongoing motivation and drive, you know, to see this very cruel and uh, bloody matter through. So look, now I have a question where I think, <clears throat> which is very interesting to us because it was mentioned already by Christine and also by myself, and it's in the description of your book. A lot of historians have the luxury of being very far from their topics, you know, I mean, we all have our own motivations and perspectives, but this is your hometown, you know, this is no laughing matter because you know, uh, you are talking not about an isolated event. You're talking, as you said, also, it's about the construction of a new society, too. And it's of the, um, what do you say, um, basically, uh, the benefit and the, the um, uh, rise of new elites, you know, that uh, get property and uh, as a starting point, and you discussed this as well. So you are actually dealing, you know, with people and their descendants who are there in your city where you come from. So this is the one aspect, you know, how does that work, you know, writing such a history that's so close to you and at the same time, <clears throat> it's so difficult. It's, it's a sensitive level already on the national uh, um, uh, level for you. And here, property is always important when people think about compensation and all these things. But in your case now, it's also this personal and local level. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should start with my personal story, how, uh, how I came to learn about the Armenians of Aintab in my hometown uh, and how, this, how I decided to study uh, this subject and write this book. Uh, I also wrote it in, in the preface of the book. Um, so uh, I, I, I was just a college graduate and back home and in, I was in Aintab. So a friend of mine called me, she, want, she, she wanted to meet. And then she asked me to come to Kayajik Street, Kayajik Mahallesi uh, or Bay Mahallesi. It was used to be known. Uh, and, and this word didn't mean anything to me back then actually. So, it was just another district in the city, a neighborhood I never visited and of which I knew nothing. So uh, she said she would wait for me at Papyrus, Caf Papyrus Cafe uh, and gave me directions. So I found this place. And upon arrival, I found myself like dazed by a charming atmosphere and letting myself get lost uh, in the side streets, leaving my poor friend waiting some more. And, and I found myself asking, where am I? Where is this place, actually? I was on a narrow street with beautifully uh, constructed stone houses lining each side, taking you back to a simpler, although slightly mysterious time, you know. And so finally, I found Papyrus Cafe, uh, which turned out to be located in one of those uh, exotic houses. Uh, and Upon entering, a few letters carved at the top of the this majestic gate, you know, and caught my eye. And not recognizing the script, I simply assumed they were uh, Ottoman characters. I mean, so inside, I was once more left speechless because there was a spacious courtyard with staircases on either side leading up to the two large rooms welcome me and so forth. So I decided to, it, it, was, it was like an experience of historical voyeurism for me and like stepping into a living, living museum, let's say. So I decided to talk to the owner, just try to glean some information uh, about the history of the house. I approach him and then uh, I ask, I was just wondering from whom did you get this place? 
who was here before you. He virally explained that he inherited this, this place from his grandfather. It must have been especially the strong coffee <laughs> they were serving that day and, and I was emboldened to press further. So, and how about your grandfather, I asked. So from whom did he, did he buy this place? He paused hesitantly before responding. And then after a few moments, he softly murmured the ground beneath, okay? He, the ground, ground beneath him, there were Armenians here. I said, what Armenians? What are you talking about? Were there Armenians in Gaziantep? He nodded. And I was actually getting very annoyed about the um, opacity of his response, you know? So what happened to them? Where did they go? I asked. He responded very diff indifferently. They left. They're gone. So I pon and then I pondered why, let alone Armenians, why anyone, I mean, would leave, just leave and hand over such an exquisite property to someone. So that was the basic, that was the main motivation problem for me. That was actually this motivation has solely to do with my own ignorance about the history of the, the main figures of the memory of this, this, this home, my hometown. So that was the, the, the main prompt and push uh, for me to work on this subject matter. And in the high school, uh, of course, now retrospectively speaking, uh, I went to great grandchildren of these uh, local elites whose richness and wealth were based on the properties of Armenians, you know. And I went to high school with them and they were uh, grandchildren of, of these, these, these uh, people, third generation I am talking about. And and now I realize uh, how, you know, this enduring family fortunes were built on the state sanctioned expulsions and theft of assets, a story that could and should be told about other post-Ottoman peoples and lands as well, you know? So that's why I can see my, my work as an exemplary late Ottoman social history of a prosperous, but also deeply traumatized, you know, uh, provincial town. So. So people still talk to you in Gaziantep? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, social relations on the ground function differently. People, uh, you know, people can still uh, talk to you face to face when they get to know you, they can, they can engage with you. But of course, for all these serious politics and serious matters, when you start talking about that, they are quite against it. But when you get into, get, when you make sense to them, they, they, they do acknowledge what happened because they knew, they heard. They know the history of those houses better than I, better than anyone, better than I do, that's for sure. And for instance, in the, in the book, uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm showing a map, uh, using a map. It's a map by Armenian map uh, drawn by Abed, uh, uh, Abedis Sarafian in 1951. And by, uh, taking refer by taking this map as a reference, my reference point, I try to pinpoint locations of Armenian uh, houses uh, and properties, all immobile properties mostly. I pinpointed 460 around 460 locations. And also I try to uh, identify trajectory of the ownership of the properties in question. So that's, I uh, came up with a timeline and also the ownership list, who got it first and then who took over later and then who possessed later, who sold, who bought later and all the way leading up to present time. And I acquired this information by making interviews with, with the local people in the city. Yeah, but um, it is courageous. And for those in the audience who don't know, uh, Umit is also publishing in Turkish. He also a few years ago had a book with a very uh, prestigious Turkish publishing house, Elitishim, on Ga uh, Gazi Antep as well. So it's not, you know, that it's only 
a communication to the outside is also communicating these things uh, to back home. So now um, a little bit uh, uh, back to the topic and the time again, one of the questions from the audience uh, was about the different groups involved, because now we had kind of, you know, these uh, profiteers, new arising elites and um, the Armenians expropriated. So we had a question about the neighbors, you know, neighbors is uh, becoming a very uh, important term looking also at um, the Holocaust. Um, the question here was about neighbors as such, you know, how did neighbors play a part in all of this directly or indirectly and also the role of um, Kurdish, uh, the Kurdish population. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very good question. Um, I, um, I, I saw one, interviews one interview um made by uh michael hagobian with an armenian survivor from ainta so this interview is available in uh, the archives of shaw foundation university at the university of southern california and the and the genocide survivor from ainta and he made the interview in turkish in uh, speaking turkish in ainta dialect by the way, and he said, he vividly recalled uh, when they were, um, when they evacuated their, uh, their house uh, with the family, whole family, because they received the deportation order for, I mean, deportation order for this particular family. And they were about to uh, set, set, uh, uh, set the, uh, to the road and when they were passing by the street, Muslim neighbors of the same neighborhood uh, come out of their windows and they start to sing, eat yola bindi, eat yola bindi, eat yola bindi. Means dog is on its way, the dog is on its way, the dog is, is, is on its way. So they did sing that song, you know, collectively. Uh, that was quite a moving story because really uh, Ainta, again, in comparison to uh, other provinces, especially in Eastern Anatolia and the Central Anatolia, the, the, the extent of violence was not as horrible as in the Eastern provinces. Uh, very few murderous activities, murder, murderous deeds took place in the city, in the, in the center of the city. Armenians, of course, were subjected to uh, attacks of the, you know, uh, tribes and the bands, irregular bands and so on and so forth, that their, you know, uh, money and immobile uh, wealth were plundered on the deportation roads. But in the city, when I heard that particular incident, I, I was really, really, I mean, not that much surprised, but I was surprised because uh, at the end of the day, really, even though the public participation was quite substantial and concrete in the case of Ainta, but the relations, there was a specific particular time period between these two societies, social, political, neighborhood relations were really, really uh, solid or were not prone to uh, have broken, broken off, let's say. But it happened. In the case of Ainta, uh, again, a suitable socio sociopolitical atmosphere was created uh, through the relentless efforts of these neighbors, Muslim elites, but also these ordinary Muslims. And they were these ordinary people, ordinary civilians, they were mostly provoked and incited by these big wigs, by these elites. Why? To lobby the central authorities to deport Armenians, whose deportation these elites then facilitate in return for obtaining the Armenians' uh, uh, abundant, so-called abundant material riches, of course. So during 1915, these elites propagandized against Armenians. Armenians were firing the mosques, Armenians were raping Muslim uh, uh, women and so on and so forth, presenting them spuriously as a rebellious threat, as had been done previously in 1895 too. So, and this seizure and transfer of Armenian property um, undergirded this pop popular support, 
for the deportation and the ultimate elimination of their fellow citizens. So because the Armenians had constituted the middle and upper middle class of the entire population, and they had predominated in manufacturing, agricultural production, and interregional trade. So that's why their expulsion was a moment for opportunity for the bandits who robbed Armenians of their personal belongings on the road, and especially for Aintab's Muslim elites who seized the assets and properties the Armenians left behind. So these elites had already done their part toward purging the Deir city of its Armenians by lobbying Ottoman authorities in the imperial center for months and months, changing, charging, sorry, their unwanted neighbors with rebellion and treason and demanding their expulsion. And once the deportations began by August uh, 1st, 1915, Aintab gentry, they were well positioned to appropriate Armenian goods, properties, and businesses, either directly or via uh, the good offices of the abandoned property commissions and liquidation commissions indirectly through the state. So the CUP functionaries of Aintab, including Ali Jenani, District Governor Ahmed Faik Bey and the Bulashik Zade Mufti Arif Efendi, these were the three key actors who orchestrated all these uh, plunder and the, uh, 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 the so called, uh, quote unquote, necessary atmosphere in the city. And also, people, they were the people in good standing with them, with the central authorities. War veterans were those uh, most likely to receive monies businesses and properties or to lease them for nominal fees, for instance, in turn, uh, in turn, uh, transform those people into capitalists. We are talking about the mayor, we are talking about the court officials, tax and treasury administrators, title deeds officers, security forces, they also obtain uh, immobile and mobile assets of Armenians. So we are talking about the leading families of Ainta. Jenani Zade, Mennan Zade, Tahchi Zade, Dai Zade, Ketuda Zade, Battal Zade, Haja Azade, and, and, and they secure their control first and foremost over the local CEP organization and parliamentary representation for the city as well. So these individuals were far from the only beneficiaries, direct perpetrators of the massacres. Uh, often, had their own pecuniary motives, okay? So viewing the entirety of the process, the function of appropriation was as important as the individual purposes. Huge, I'm talking about huge numbers of people who were bound, to, bound together in the circle of profit. That was at the same time, a circle of complicity. Thank you. Um, we have one question, perhaps also uh, connecting actually to your last uh, sentence here. Um, a question from the audience. How closely coordinated the Commission for the Abandoned Properties uh, was working with the Directorate for the Settlement of Tribes and Immigrants? Uh, how their relationship is in this period and under your, uh, in your research? So, uh, first, in, uh, first, first of all, we should talk about uh, the legal mechanisms and, and we are talking about series of laws, degrees, status, temporary laws, which were known as abundant properties. Of course, here, the word abundant here, is, it's a euphemism. I'm using it only for reference. So, and uh, these abundant property uh, on June 10, 1915, uh, there was a regulation, 34 article, and this regulation stipulated the formation of abundant pr property commissions and in June 1915. And the, the, the duty of these commissions was to administer, secure, and also register mobile and immobile properties of the, uh, uh, of the Ottoman citizens who were subject to deportation. It didn't say deportation. It's, it, of, of course, it said in the document relocation. Or resettlement. Uh, it's this 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 regulation. It seems that okay, state was taking care of the properties, protecting them, maintaining them, and trying to sell them, and then get the revenue and and maintain the revenue on behalf of the of its 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 own citizen. But on twenty sixth of September nineteen fifteen, they promulgated 
another law, which was known as the first liquidation law of the uh, Ottoman uh, of the Ottoman um, Union and Progress Party government. This uh, on on the basis of this law, the liquidation abandoned property commissions were transformed into abandoned property liquidation commissions, and their first duty, according to their one article, properties which were uh, immobile and which were prone to be sold out are going to be liquidated. How? Through auctions. And members of these abandoned property commissions were composing of one member from the Minister of Finance, another member from the Minister of Treasury, and another member from the, uh, the uh, local, from, from the locals, from the representative of the city. So they, uh, so these commissions basically were comp uh, composed of three, you know, people, and they were, um, they work under the jurisdiction of Minister of Finance, Treasury, and Minister of Interior. Since these uh, records of abandoned property and liquidation commissions uh, are in inaccessible to date, also uh, safekeeping reports, so relocation reports, are also inaccessible to researchers. We don't know exactly what is the real relationship between uh, directorate of settlement and tribes and the property commissions. Why? It should be linked to one another because most of these immobile properties were given to immigrants and refugees who came from not only Balkans and the Caucasian regions as of 1911 and 1912. Actually, you can go back to even 1856, the Crimean War. Anyway, it was a series of waves of uh, uh, flows of migrations. Uh, but these properties were also given to uh, 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 immigrants. So they were refugees, they were immigrants. So the Ottoman Empire, the, the relevant department, which was the Directorate for Settlement and Tribes, they made this clear cut distinction. So, multejiler, uh, refugiler. So, immigrants from Kurdish immigrants, Arab immigrants, Circassian immigrants, who were, uh, who were settled from one city to another within the Asia Minor from Adana to Antep, for instance, or from Diyarbakir to Sivas. These uh, immigrants were also given to these properties. Okay, um, so Umit, now comes the part that I hate most about this uh, kind of job, when I have to tell you to keep your answers short now for the next few that we have. I'm sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> we have some from the audience. Um, <clears throat> one connects to basically what you just started talking about, the kind of different classes uh, profiting from the um, uh, redistribution of wealth. We had a question asking you, um, you know, it seems, you know, what we said before, uh, probably until this last uh, part of the conversation, that is mostly, you know, what become the new elites, you know, uh, the question was about the working class. How did they profit from this plunder of Armenian wealth? And I will give you also the next question. You can perhaps do the, those two together. Um, there was a question about what about uh, international repercussions of this plunder of wealth, you know, uh, because it's something, you know, that, and we know this from our research, you know, also people abroad um, uh, noticed and recognized what was the reaction to this part of what was going on at the time abroad. Yeah. Uh, first part of the question, first question, it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, and I also analyze the answer of the question in the detailed manner in the relevant relevant chapter within the book. Uh, actually, uh, when we are talking about plunder or obtaining these properties via so-called legal process or via plunder, plunder of economy, which I call, these properties, these assets, these tools and everything, they were uh, uh, already wealthy rich Muslim families, Muslim, that's why I call them, they, they, are, they are Ayan, they are local elites, they are landowners, big wigs, they were, and also civil, civil military officers as well, including them. These guys, they were already politically very strong and also had good terms with the central government and they were active members of Eintop CUP club. And these, these were the people 
local elites who were already rich acquired these properties. So they consolidated, that's why they consolidated their uh, class status, you know, from 1915, 1918, 19, uh, and by the depart total departure of Armenians from Ayantap to Beirut and Aleppo after 1921, these elites, you know, uh, again, continue acquiring uh, kind of so-called buying out these properties through, you know, auctions at ridiculous prices. So already politically, economically powerful, strong elites acquire these properties. What happened to working class, let's say, actually real story and the, which the, makes the story very spicy from that moment. Because during the French occupation of the city, the real power, real uh, effort was shown by this working class, let's, I mean, I, I don't, there was no working class in the first place back then, but let's say working class retrospectively, because they were actually uh, like uh, ordinary Muslims uh, from different neighborhoods. They were quite nationalists, they were ethno-nationalists, they were religiously nationalists, and these people were really defending their hometown against not only French forces, also Armenians, because for them, in their eyes, the real occupation force was not, was not French, they were Armenians. And these were the people, ordinary people, who by heart, wholeheartedly supported, financially, logistically, whatever they had at their hands, to Kemalist national, national forces in the city, Kuwait Milia. Not, and these forces, these Kemalist national forces were not supported financially and logistically, log logistically by these local elites in the first place. They were very dubious, very doubtful about the Kemalist forces. They didn't want these forces in the city because they believed neither British nor French occupation forces are going to touch upon their property. They, they did not ask for restitution. They did not put them on, on trial for their you know, atrocities during the massacres and deportation and so forth. When these two processes started and gained acceleration, these local elites who were hiding in their farms and village, adjacent villages, all of a sudden they came out and they decided to support financially and logistically to Kemalist nation's forces in order of, uh, in order not to give these properties back to their real owners. The real fight started at that moment. And then afterwards, uh, these ordinary people who put all these strenuous, strenuous efforts to defend the city, who became you know, famished, who gave everything at their hands and so forth, they were also expecting you know, properties. They were also expecting certain rewards, but they didn't get what they, so-called desert and the real political and uh, political fight and uh, and also conflict started in Aintab in early 20s and 30s from this vantage point and the economic and political uh, especially economic classes in Aintab were constituted along those lines and these people ordinary people this fight continue until the establishment of Democrat Party in 1950. When Democrat Party was established, all these people who, who believe that they didn't deserve what they, they, they didn't got what they did, they didn't get what they deserve as a result of this, you know, uh, their efforts and support during the French occupation, the, uh, evacuating the city out of the Armenians and so on and so forth. They became members of Democrat Party massively. Thank you. Um, so look, I don't want to close this evening before asking you about the future. <clears throat> it's always a good question for historians. I want to ask you about future project of yours after now having finished this wonderful project. Thank you very much. Uh, future projects. Um, I'm actually getting away from, um, let's say this violent aspect of, 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 of uh, Armenian, Armenian studies uh, or I'm, I'm a little bit uh, getting away from this, this, this aspect of the field, but now I'm working on different projects. And first, uh, I am focused now, I am trying to analyze a particular uh, adultery uh, incident which took place in Adapazare in 1911. And 
three Armenians, two Greek guys in an Armenian uh, uh, hammam or sauna, whatever. They were uh, caught with a Muslim prostitute and they were taking custody, put on trial. They were set free and the district governor of Tutan was against this decision and tried to put them in prison and condemn all these things. And he, but in order to get support from the Muslim and the Muslim community, he distorted this event and showed that uh, Christians were violating Muslim women. So, but he did not specify the woman actually was making her living by prostitution. And, but he didn't get uh, the uh, necessary support in his mind from uh, Muslim community. And because Muslim community, they, are, they maintain the fact that they are getting along with their Christian fellow. Uh, so they decided to uh, write a complaint letter about this district governor and they decided to maintain the constitutional regime against this district governor. So what I'm trying to analyze from on the basis of this particular incident, possibility of uh, Ottoman civic citizenship in this small town, which, is very, which was very close to Istanbul, the capital city of the empire at the time, immediately before the Balkan war and the war in Tripoli, time, the Trip Tripoli. And I try to uh, analyze the notion of restraint of violence in this, in this small town. Uh, this is one of the projects. Another project is I'm uh, writing a biography of um, Mustafa Reşat Mimaroğlu, uh, who was taking charge of arrest of Intellect, Armenian intellectuals in Istanbul on 24th of April, 1915. He was a very trusted uh, guy and officer of uh, Inferior Minister Talat Bey. He was very close, he had very close links with him and he was working under his jurisdiction. And he was the one who pursued activities of Armenian intellectuals in Istanbul. He spoke and read Armenian pretty well and he took uh, Armenian private courses from Diran Kelekyan, who was arrested by him on 24th of April as well. And this guy, after fulfilling his duty during the uh, war period, genocide period as well, uh, during the Republican period, he climbed to the echelons of the state one by one, and he became the president of the Court of Appeal in Turkey and also became a deputy of Republican People Party in early 1950s. And I'm right, I am writing uh, his biography in order to show uh, the continuity of the rank and file of the CUP and the Republican regime. And Wonderful, so we have a lot to look forward to. Uh, interesting, okay. exciting books. Um, <clears throat> So I hope we were able to convince you all in the audience today a little bit, not only to buy his book, but also to think more about property. Um, for me always, and now you didn't answer too much this question about international, um, uh, you know, echoes and stuff. Oh, I want sorry. to give a little... Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally forget. International repercussion. I can answer this very briefly if you like. The floor is yours, of course. <laughs> Thanks. So in the past, in the past five to six years, uh, actually there have been a tendency among the Armenian diaspora in United States and in Europe to open a lawsuit in Turkish courts about uh, reclaiming their property, not reclaiming the value of their properties according to current uh, present currency and so forth. And uh, actually, these these are doable. They have such a right to open a lawsuit within the within the boundary of Turkish Turkish Republic. Turkish courts are. Turkish courts have to take these cases, to take, have to look at those cases, but you need a reliable, trustworthy lawyer who actually, who was, who is bold, who's supposed to be bold enough to take those cases. And there were such lawyers in Turkey, like five years, six years ago, when the political climate and atmosphere was relatively speaking, was, uh, you know, better vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, today. Uh, so these, uh, these cases, I, I am not very optimistic about uh, the results of these cases. It's, it seems impossible to acquire the 
the the uh, value of uh, the the proper the, the abundant properties stolen properties of London properties but these uh, court cases uh, would enable the lawyers of uh, Armenians who open all these lawsuits to get into the title deeds archives and to see the trajectory of the properties their own properties so that that's very valuable. You know, title these archives are also closed and inaccessible to researchers in Turkey as well. So uh, they do have such a right. In its political implications, I think it will come to naught, unfortunately. And now, uh, considering the, the the bleak and grim political uh, climate of Turkey, it seems impossible to continue this process now. Thank you for that addition. So um, I will continue with my wrapping up speech. Um, <clears throat> so um, for the international dimension now going a little bit back, um, I think it's important to stress, um, as you know, sometimes if you're not a specialist or working or thinking a lot about the Armenian genocide, you know, it was something that um, really agitated the world over during World War One, but also in the years afterwards. And I don't want to push my own work on the topic, but what I found really interesting is that after there was a debate around the German, uh, the Armenian genocide in Germany in the mid 1920s, a German Jew wrote a book criticizing the new far right movements and such. And he wrote there that you know if these Turkish lessons as the Nazis, um, as the Nazis formulate them or they understand them, it would mean the death of all the Jews in Germany and Austria and their restribution of property to the Aryans. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was interesting that in this one sentence, you know, he goes from <clears throat> the physical violence and the killing immediately to the property. So if we still didn't convince you that property is important in the context of genocide, <clears throat> I will urge you to buy Umid's book, oh, now it's here, uh, mirrored. Harvard University Press did a very nice job uh, with this book and they're doing a good job with keeping the prices down. So, oh, I see some in the audience have it already. Wonderful support Imit and his future work. Thank you so much for taking the time and thanks to the Wiener Library for having us tonight. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the library to both of you. Um, congratulations, Umit, on your book, um, which I also have. Thank you for sending it to us for our collection as well. Um, and thank you to Stefan for your, your really, really insightful questions, which I think you know, captured the essence of the book um, in a sense. And I think, and I've, I've already had a, a few comments from people saying, yes, we're going to be buying the book. So hopefully um, that turns into uh, more proliferation of your research and more dissemin dissemination to, to more people. So thank you again. And thank you to the audience for your very insightful questions. And, um, and thank you, especially to both of you for doing this so late. I know that it's a, a bit later in, uh, in Israel. So thank you again. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. everybody. Wonderful comments and feedback. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.